Have you ever stumbled across a game wondering why you never heard of it? You may know of the developer Torn Banner and their work on Chivalry and Chivalry 2. Both games I thoroughly enjoy. But what about Mirage Arcane Warfare? I wasn't aware of this game's existence until I accidentally stumbled across it during my research on Chivalry 2 for the sound design project. And as a fan of Torn Banner, I cannot believe that I just completely missed it. I really didn't know what to expect from the game, but what I could conclude from watching some gameplay videos is that it is a game that contains lots of stabbing, blood, and excessive screaming. So I figured why not just get the game? Initially I wanted to just get it for research purposes for that other production, but then curiosity set in and I became increasingly more interested in what Mirage was like. So I quickly went to Steam and… no results? Darn. The game was on Steam before, but sadly it was taken down. So what we have here is not only a dead game, but also a classic case of abandonware. I was a bit desperate, so I searched around for other ways to get the game. An obvious avenue being places where you can download games for free. But get this, every torrent I found, every download link, everything was dead. This game is absolutely inaccessible and the only way to gain access to the files is to make use of key shops. So reluctantly, I bought a key and activated it. I didn't quite know what to expect after booting up the game. Will I have wasted 5 euros for a game I will never even get to play? Apparently not. So the game did start, but the first impression I got from the game was a concerning one. The training mode is greyed out and I cannot access it. The game is multiplayer only mind you, without any options when it comes to configuring your own private bot matches. I didn't expect anything good upon clicking on the server browser icon, but I was met with a surprise I had not expected. A single server, which during the time I have played was always up. Going into a match I was met with a well-polished slasher game. Hit sounds are incredibly satisfying. The character design was well thought out and memorable. Level design is great, being handled well mechanically but also visually, featuring beautiful vistas and locales once everything is loaded. The game seems to perform well too, at least on my machine. Of all things, the graphical style of the game really jumps out. Everything is clean, cartoony and vibrant, and an especially great change of pace is the setting. Instead of clanky knight armor, Zweihänder and big castles waiting to get overrun by the Mason Red Menace, we find ourselves amidst temples, turbans and mysterious jinns somewhere in the Orient. Such a refreshing presentation. I was blown away by how the game looks, but sadly, no one cares about Aladdin. This is Soldier Dave, a slasher game enthusiast who is an especially big fan of Mirage Arcane Warfare. He followed Torn Banner games since their inception and went on to become a skilled player in the slasher genre, wielding a mighty mustache I can only wish to grow one day. He even keeps the spirit of Mirage alive by leading a Chivalry 2 clan bearing Mirage's name. Being an outsider when it comes to the slasher genre in the grand scheme of things, I didn't know what to think of Mirage and the state it is in right now, so I figured I would go and ask the formerly most dedicated of players, the Mirage leftovers. In my conversation with Dave, it became clear that Chivalry fans were quite displeased with Mirage, the setting being seen as considerably egregious by those players. There's a lot of people that were kind of, I don't want to say racist towards the game, but it they really didn't like the Arabic-esque theme. Uh, and they made it, they were very vocal about it for a little bit. That insight comes from the second expert on the matter, Pandora, the first longtime dedicated server hoster for Mirage right after the game went offline. Another person who, like Dave, showcased incredible passion for Mirage during our conversation. I love the art style, but sadly, yeah. Sorry, not sorry, Torn Banner. No one cares about Arabian Nights. No one is thinking fucking Jafar and Aladdin when they're trying to play uh, an FPS. This takes a very sort of ethnic spin on it. This takes it to the Middle East. And as Frosty mentioned, many people in the States don't really have the most trust for the people in the Middle East. That seems to be strike one for the game. Beauty lies in the eye of the beholder, and while me and many of the Mirage leftovers love how the game looks, 
I can also understand how the art style might throw other fans of the slasher genre off. And respectfully so. I mean, this is why most of the slashers and all of them coming up in the future that are in development are medieval. Because they need to have a sort of broad appeal to be able to get some sales initially. Torn Banner, what the hell are you thinking? Seriously? For, for, as you guessed from the title, yeah, this is a rant on Mirage Arcane Warfare and Torn Banner. What the fuck are you thinking? Really? Have you, has anyone seen the trailer? I mean, please, the graphics look like they're from Borderlands, which Borderlands, you know, it, it, it had its moments. It, it looked very, you know, it looked nice for what it was. But this is supposed to be a game by Torn Banner, the people who made Chivalry Medieval Warfare. What are you doing? Even Deadliest Warrior had decent enough graphics. Come on. But that is only the graphics. How does the game actually compare to other slasher titles? At its core, Mirage Arcane Warfare is quite similar to Chivalry Medieval Warfare. It essentially features the same combat and movement systems with some significant tweaks applied to the gameplay. For one, on top of a typical Chivalry mouse movement which controls the pivoting of a character's torso from the waist up, Mirage is the only slasher game that features true verticality. Movement abilities, clambering, and much more create a unique experience which is notably absent in Chivalry Medieval Warfare, Mortar, Chivalry 2, and all upcoming slasher projects from other studios. Second, the effectiveness of swing manipulation has been reduced. In case you have no idea what that means, let me show you something. In slasher titles, the swords possess so-called active hitboxes, also known as tracers. When swinging a sword, anything in its path is susceptible to damage. When swinging the mouse during an attack animation, you can manipulate the position of the sword in the game world while the animation is playing. By moving your body during an attack animation, the player can make the attack appear quicker or slower, or make it swing through a larger space which is perfect for confusing opponents and gaining an advantage in combat. Chivalry Medieval Warfare is the game that revolutionized this type of sword combat, but it wasn't the first to implement the system. The roots of the slasher genre, arguably, could be found in the Jedi Knight series, where lightsabers could be wiggled, accelerated and dragged to kill opponents more rapidly. Mountain Blade also features swing manipulation, to some extent, but Chivalry Medieval Warfare takes the cake in regards to what is possible with swing manipulation. As I alluded to before, mouse movement affects the rotation and pivot of the player character. And when attacking while pivoting and rotating the body of the character in certain ways, we can achieve an incredibly convoluted combat style, which is often referred to as ballerina combat. This controversial fighting style is possible because swinging the sword does not take velocity or physics into account whatsoever. After the wind-up, from the beginning of an attack swing till the end, a swing can damage you. So when crouching and looking up to the sky, the player character pivots in such a way that when he commits to an overhead swing, the attack can land on a person standing behind the attacker, getting hit from below. And the player can even receive a second hit when the player turns around in time for the end of the animation. It was heavily debated if swing manipulation to this extent should exist in slasher games, and whether or not a system that enables ridiculous attacks like overhead rainbows is functioning as intended. At some point Torn Banner encouraged players to be aware of swing manipulation to get better at the game, but Mirage, Chivalry 2, and even Chivalry's competitor Mortal made sure to lessen the degrees of motion the player can manipulate their swings with. Dragging or accelerating swings is still possible, but spinning around like a Beyblade is not going to reap too many positive results in your slasher games, or may even be completely ineffective. But similar to strafe jumping in Quake, those unintended gameplay elements were widely appreciated by the community of hardcore players as more control of the swords results in much more difficult to master and exciting combat. Nowadays, many players would look down on swing manipulation as it exists in Chivalry Medieval Warfare, but back then, those somewhat unintended mechanics were largely accepted by the dedicated slasher players. Now, I know, this is a review of Mirage and I am showing an awful lot of gameplay from seemingly unrelated games, but this information is important for you to understand why Mirage died. See. 
Torn Banner reworked the combat system and reduced the effectiveness of swing manipulation a little bit. They kept trying to remove drags from the torrent, and I'm still doing them. Everyone is still doing them. You can keep trying to nerf players as much as you want, but it's not going to happen. They literally find the best way to play, and they nerf it. Or the, the most skillful way to play, which right now, you know, drags. There's not really much in the way of getting rid of somebody's parry. A lot of people dislike that a lot of the chivalry bugs were, were fixed. Like, frankly, there's things that you can do in Chivalry 1 that you just can't do in Mirage because they're, they're bugs. Like rainbowing, for example, in Chivalry is, is a bug. Mm -hmm. You can't really do that in Mirage. Uh, people hated that. Mirage Arcan Warfare, as the name implies, is a slasher game which introduced magical spells into the gameplay. So a player had an expanded arsenal with well-thought-out magical spells on top of the slashing, stabbing, and obligatory screaming. I think the game is pretty fucking fun. Like, no game does what this game tries to do, in my opinion, in the same way. It does this really cool uh, theme and sort of genre melding uh, between Shiv and something akin to, oh, I don't know, like, a, like an ability... Uh, action multiplayer game. The game also introduced significantly more team-oriented gameplay into a genre of games that normally favors individual ability, which slasher game enthusiasts were not too happy about. Mirage is somewhat also like TF2. It's probably in the middle of TF2 and Mirage because it had the magic and also different characters. And these different characters or classes um, had different abilities and stuff that sort of complemented each other to create a sort of teamwork dynamic. The problem is slasher players could not care less. <laughs> I don't get it. And that's all because Torn Banner doesn't give a flying fuck. They just want money. It's all it's ever been about for them. They made a good game and now it's fuck you community, we're doing what we want. Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if it was someone in the business department saying, oh yes, our statistics show that the best way to make money is to add magic. Fuck you, Torn Banner. That's not the way to do it. It's not all with cold, calculated numbers. It's about enjoyment, which you clearly do not have. Uh, the, the slasher genre holds people that are very prideful, and, and it is a genre built upon self-improvement on your individual mechanical skill. And while people do like the idea of working as a team, you'll often see matches where it's like 5v5, five people versus five people in something like Chivalry or Chivalry 2, or Mordhau, you'll often see them devolve into a series of five duels. And then, you know, eventually, like, whatever team finishes off an enemy on the other just starts ganking the rest. That's not a bad thing, but it obviously impeded on the ga this game's success because what this game did is it took away your effectiveness as an individual. Another thing that the community wasn't too fond of was the style of multiplayer combat that was put on the table. Mirage kind of feels like a fusion of Chivalry and Overwatch, and to many it isn't quite clear if Torn Banner had that original idea, or if they decided to go for Overwatch-type gameplay because it was popular at the time. Because this game is so unlike Overwatch. Um, I was reading a Steam review, in fact, recently, that effectively equated this game to Overwatch. Uh, and I, I think that's so dumb. Like, there is, there's so little in common. There are abilities, sure. There are three abilities, oh my. Um, there is a nice, colorful color palette. There, mm, like, there isn't an international theme, which Overwatch has going for it. Uh, there isn't a mass of classes to choose from. So I don't, I don't see the, the similarities there. Anyway. A nickname that people had for it when it came out was Sloverwatch. Because <laughs> people, really, they thought it played slower than Overwatch. Um, it doesn't, I promise. <laughs> And they thought it played slower than Overwatch. And also, you have to understand that this, when this came out, Overwatch was in its prime. Like, yeah. it was a cultural icon, not just a game. You know? Uh, the, the pornography alone. Yeah, the and, SFM threads were filled with Overwatch. Exactly. 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 But does the similarity to Overwatch really matter? If anything, I believe that Mirage achieved better executed combat and more thought-out abilities than Overwatch could offer, and that its team-based classes are its strengths rather than a weakness. Speaking of which, let us talk about them.
Mirage features six distinct classes who all have their own personality. The Torrent was the Chivalry player's character of choice, as his stats were ideal for melee combat and his magical abilities were straightforward. Many of his battle cries are hilariously incoherent, <laughs> and it seems like this guy is on a constant bloodlust. The Vipress possesses strong spells, which can greatly enhance her mobility. She is especially great for covering huge distances and ambushing enemies by surprise. Judging by looks alone, she might also be the best looking character of the bunch, which Torn Banner must have been aware of, as she has been Mirage's cover girl ever since this game was announced. Tinker, my favorite class, is all about laying down traps and messing with opponents. She also is a bratty girl with an attitude. The delightfully rotund Entropist is geared towards support with his healing spells and ranged attack options. And if you, unlike most other players who played this game, actually do care about Aladdin, get this, the Entropist can take off and fly on a flying carpet. Alchemancer is incredibly interesting because he is a much more palpable version of Chivalry's Archer. All of his projectiles can be blocked and even deflected back at him with every character on the roster, depending on skill. This is in contrast to archers as they have existed prior, who deal unblockable damage unless you have a shield. In Mirage, all magic is blockable, even Alchemancer's basic attacks and spells. Last but not least, we've got the Vigilist, a war-hardened misandrist who is an effective disabler and tough to fight against, as her spells can nullify any spell opponents may throw at her, and for a short duration of time, she can even negate all types of damage with an armor skin ability. Additionally, out of an arsenal of spells, the player can only select three to take with them. Most classes feature two spells to choose between for each magic spell slot which introduces more granularity to combat and ability options than Overwatch or even Chivalry could ever offer. Due to brevity, I won't go into detail with what each individual spell can do or in what ways each class can be played, as each class can be played in different ways and spells are not one-dimensional. For instance, as a Tinker you have the choice between an Obelisk and Mines, both being effective traps. When picking mines, you can set them up and then later pull an enemy right into the mines as a deadly combo. Choosing to pick the obelisk of course has its combat advantages too. But interestingly, it can aid the tinker in her movement options greatly. Every class has great movement options, and I was very glad when Dave hopped in game with me and showcased how spells could potentially be used other than for dealing damage to an enemy. Let's just say I wanted to get up there, right? Mm -hmm. This is like... A noob would just do it like this, or not even a noob, but like a pro player that just doesn't care about magic would do this. And then maybe a slightly more experienced player would like, you know, do this. But then like somebody who really was in tune with the game would like double jump to an obwitz to kickflip and they would be just zooming across the map. I have like pounce and dash attack and I can pounce and then I can also dash attack after wow. that. The air and you, you can see, you can go, exactly, it can be insane. So there's like that point all the way over there on the opposite side. And instead of just like, you know, obviously climbing all the way, I could sort of, uh, if you want to follow me with your flying carpet, I could just get crazy distance. And I could also use this to completely trip someone up in a fight because now they have to worry about a whole other axis, which is above them. I could like go over here and it's just, crazy wow. how you much across the entire arena in like yeah a second. the entire yeah exactly it's absolutely insane um and then you know other aspects i like is the cell shading how beautiful the game looks just casually looks very very nice um which i love yeah so if i see let's just say i saw an enemy on the ridge up there right like a character like vipress is known for her mobility so i can already just like launch myself this far in a moment's notice and that made high-level play very skill-based. We all love Fatty. His other his teleport ability is pretty unique as well. He basically throws an orb, and then whenever he presses the button again, he teleports to the orb, so I could throw it, and it'll just keep flying until I press the teleport button. And you could also use this to teleport behind people. So this entire battlefield, I could throw it and then teleport behind them. If I see, like, up here, I could, I could kind of potentially get up here if I was skill-based enough. 
maybe not this. Yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah, so this character has his tackle, right? Which is mm -hmm. pretty simple. But if you want to, you can actually just aim it up, right? Ooh, okay. Or in any direction you want. This is another thing, like, like, see, because pros wouldn't barely use the magic, so they just wouldn't even discover this. So if I was, for example, like over here, but there was an enemy up there, I could simply just aim my tackle there and then tackle upward. And I could do that with all of my abilities. So even my whirlwind, which is where like I just spin around with uh, with my sword, can be used for hover. A lot of abilities in this game offer passive called hover. And you can actually see if you hold F1, you can see the passive attributes of your spells. It'll say like hover or AOE or movement. Oh, wow. Because, you know, it provides that. They really give you all the information um, and this is another reason where place where they step back from chivalry too. This can give you all the numbers. It's like, do you want to know the exact cast time of the spell, bro? 0.525 seconds. That's very yep. precise. Okay. Exactly. They were like, oh, you want this information? We, bro, we got you. In chivalry two, you don't even know the damage number of your weapon. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know your health bar because there's no number on your health bar. You just have to hope that you know what health you have. It's crazy bad. Um, but I can like combine my spells right here, so. I can combine a wall jump to a tackle to a whirlwind to a punch. And you can see I'll just be in the air for like an hour. Like, Oh, wow. It's just, it's just insane. Like, like the, thing I see, the thing I see here, you know, first of all, with these moves like strung together. I mean, this is, of course, I mean, it has offensive viability. It has uh, evasion viability, uh, but it also has like movement viability. Like if you just need to get up somewhere and like the fight is like far away, oh, you course. can just use your abilities. Yeah. And, yeah, like see a guy over there. Mm -hmm. I could jump blue, and then if I even even if I miss the jump a little, I can clamber to finish it off. Yeah, combat using spells or defending against those spells also can be quite exciting. Magic can also be fainted. So yeah, you can faint your magical spells. Um, not all of them, but anything with a pretty long cast time could be fainted. So this explosive punch, I could like, and then just oh. faint it, and that would put on a five second cooldown. Oh, oops, okay, I, f I fucked that one up. Yeah, I don't. I don't think any of her spells can be fainted. Oh, um, the mine can be fainted. I just oh, the that. mine can be fainted. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and that also made it even more skill based because, you know, I mean, I don't know. Like, a lot of the uh, these abilities, you really don't want to get hit by, especially something like explosive punch. You can see this thing is incredibly powerful. Uh, or the whirlwind. This, it, these are crazy strong spells, and so fainting them could uh could give you a really good advantage. For example, one maneuver I like to do back in the day is the Chaos Orb. I would throw it right, and then you would block it, and then that'd be done. But if I teleported above you, right, then when I threw it down at you, you would sort of have to be much more accurate with where you blocked it, because you have to block in a sort of direction in this game, right? Mm -hmm. And if I throw it behind you, and you try and block, you will not block it. You'll have to block toward it to block it. So I would teleport above people, and then throw it down at them. And then they would just sort of have to guess where it's going to be or use their own abilities to outmaneuver the, and try and get away from me. My favorite ability was this uh, bird. This fucking bird, dude. You throw out a little egg and then you throw a bird and then you can actually guide it by moving your screen where you want. So oh. if, if I want to throw this bird and then look toward the left, it would go to the left. And you can see me guide it uh, indefinitely. So let, let me throw it right here. Even Alchemancer's basic attack uh, is can be curved. Not as much as the birds, but you can see, right, I can either shoot it straight, I can make it curve up to the left. Ooh. And this also created for massive skill-based shots. A torrent isn't just a torrent, and any other class of Mirage should be treated the same way. Choosing a spell over another can bring serious differences in playstyle to any class you picked. Hopefully now you see the potential this game offers. In terms of game modes, we have the usual suspects, those being Team Deathmatch, Capture a Flag, and Arena. And then there is the classic Team Objective, a mix between Capture Points and Payload Escort. Torn Banner had ambitious plans regarding Mirage's game modes, and what we got certainly wasn't all that was planned. So anything, any game modes that Chivalry had, they wanted in this game. I know that there was alternate, like, objective game modes that they were talking about adding, but they never, never 
got into the game. With those initial plans, Torn Banner even encouraged the community to mod the game, a position which would soon change after the game shut down. They were really big in, uh, in the beginning, pushing us to try and mod the game and make modded game modes. Um, they actually even offered to help in the beginning when the game was still supported. How did modding the game work in, in the beginning or like... Oh, no one figured it out. No one figured it out, okay. No one figured it out, no one figured it out. Uh, it, I'm a, it's, it's in theory pretty similar to Shiv 1, but nobody from the Shiv 1 modding community played uh, Arcane, Mirage Arcane Warfare and frankly there wasn't a lot of technical pow prowess on in the Mirage community. Uh, I was, I probably was the most technically proficient, but I'm just a system admin. I don't code, I don't do that shit, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know where to start. This makes me wonder, how exactly did the situation look like at the launch of the game? The launch was so bad, I was part of the alpha and beta for the game, and I did not know the game had launched almost a month after it had launched. Really? That's how bad it was. Oh. Yeah. I think the game's fun, but it doesn't matter if it's fun or not. Like, this is kind of the same problem I ran into with Titanfall. If any of you played that game or still play it, the player base dwindled incredibly. I think within a year after release. I bought it on release. And the player base was maybe a couple hundred people within a year, year and a half of its release. I love the shit out of that game, man. I would play the same people all the time. And um, the thing about it is, Dunfall had great replayability, no match was the same, etc., etc. However, at the end of the day, it was the same people. You wouldn't really meet new people. Um, and that's the problem with games losing its population, is that you don't have a, lot, a whole lot of people to share the experience with. And in a, in a multiplayer-only game, like Titanfall, like this game, that is an absolute necessity. And that becomes a massive issue, an immense issue, when you start off the hop with only with less than 200 players, and today we're at 60. If you go to steamcharts.com, um, I'll link it if I remember, but if you go to steamcharts.com and you look for the, uh, the Mirage beta, it has more players in the game itself. Now, the reason for that, of course, is that the beta was free to play for a weekend. People were interested in the beta. At least partially. In this game, the full release? Not so much. The main issue of this game is simply the lack of interest. Um... It was real fucked up, even from the beginning. Like they, they did not do any sort of proper advertising. They didn't put out anything to begin with. So like from the start, it had a really low player pop. Oh, if we move it to magic, we make it more people wanting to buy our game. Yeah, that's going to go well when I know for a fact that a good percentage of the community hates this idea and probably will not purchase that. There we have another reason the game failed. Torn Banner lost money on this game, and without the support of their most dedicated fans, appreciation of something as basic as the game setting, and even one of the fundamental gameplay features, Torn Banner decided that it's best to just pull the plug. Even after making the game free to keep for a day, a promotional experiment, which jumped the player count from an average of 7 to over 40,000, and briefly made it one of the most played games on Steam, the game could not retain new blood, dropping back to 1,000 players after promotion was over and tanking further after that. Most of those who owned the game, over 1 million players by the way, never gave it a shot. For one, because of the reasons mentioned before, but also because with a sudden influx of thousands, Mirage's servers couldn't handle the load. And at some point, I think they had like 10,000 players online at once. Um, but they did not, uh, the servers couldn't handle it. Oh god. So, uh, they had all those players and the servers just kept crashing. So, no one came back. If you decide to get the game, or download it after you discover it in your Steam library, you can't expect to always find a match. At the time of writing the script, only one dedicated server exists, which is continuously being hosted by someone from the Mirage Leftovers community, running the team objective mode and endlessly cycling between maps. If this server is up when you launch the game, it can be played, as any missing human teammates will be replaced by bots. But that's a big if. Along with this, the servers holding the data on unlockables like cosmetics and ranks are gone. So the game no longer has any progression to speak of. 
I made an invite available to you in the description in order for you to join the Leftovers too, but sadly... We do not play anymore, unfortunately. Ever since Chivalry 2, the Mirage Leftovers has been completely dead. Ah, oh, too bad. Um, yeah. Yeah, ouch. So, when joining the Discord, don't expect too much activity. But it might be worth asking from time to time if anyone wants to play a match or two. Cracked game copies aren't the way to go when it comes to spreading the game too, mind you. I tried cracking the game myself, but all you have is a piece of software that launches into the main menu but cannot connect to any dedicated servers that may be running. Which would make a cracked copy of Mirage Arcane Warfare an almost 15GB waste of space on your hard drive. As to why the game died, according to Torn Banner it was due to European GDPR laws, but the leftovers and myself do not buy it. It seems more like Torn Banner saw the game's lack of success and unfortunately used GDPR as their excuse to kill it. Wanting to move on and deliver something that their fanbase would be much more in touch with. More chivalry. Everyone wanted chivalry too. I wouldn't have cared if you would have remade <laughs> Medieval Warfare and charged us full price. As long as it had updated graphics, maybe, you know, fix some of the, the, the known bugs, fix animations. Honestly, that, that, it would have been annoying, but I would have accepted that it's, it's basically a new game, you've, you've moved it to a new engine, you've fixed it, but no, we get that bullshit. So yeah, that's my response to your so-called new chivalry, which it's not. But honestly, Torn Banner, Morto, which is a game being designed by well, chivalry players, and you know why they're doing that? Because you are completely destroying chivalry. You're destroying the name that comes with it. And honestly, I look forward to the day that Morto is fully made. And yeah, that will be the end of you. Morto is already better than anything that you can ever make. The concept behind it is solid. The design is solid. And that's in alpha. So I look forward to the day that Tom ba Torn Banner, what the fuck? <laughs> the, the devs for Morto finish it, and they ruin you, really, because Morto's got everything that any sh any advanced chivalry player could ever want, and I use advanced as, as more veteran. Mirage also is deeply rooted in Chivalry 2's DNA, which means that Torn Banner will never open source the title, sell the IP for someone else to host central servers, and try to revive the game, or even give out any amount of keys, paid or not to get more people to play the title. Modding and reverse engineering also was very clearly discouraged, understandably so, as Mirage's reverse engineered code could pose a security risk to Chivalry 2. I know all of this because both Dave and Pandora told me about their plans on keeping the game alive. I actually offered to buy the game from the devs but they didn't want to sell it because they're still using the assets in the game for their modern stuff, which makes sense. So I wanted to buy the rights for the game specifically so that I could... They have some specialty servers that they use to track things like uh, uh, XP and stuff like that. Like if you, if I were to host a server now, like at the end of the game, you can say, you can rate like, how's, how was this match? How was the performance? That's not, that's literally not attached to anything. And in order to host those servers, I would have needed to own the rights to the game, unfortunately. We were hoping for a few things with Mirage, which obviously all are just like the whimsical dreams of, of unfortunately uh, enthusiastic losers. Um, which is one, we were hoping that eventually Mirage could come back in the form of it being free to play. But after some thought, it's not likely because why would Torn Banner compete with themselves in regards to Chivalry 2? Two, yeah. um, we were hoping that Torn Banner might sell the IP to someone else, but then again, that's also competing with yourself. Overall, we just they just genuinely don't want to do anything with the assets of the game, and they're willing to totally leave it in the dark forever. Only keys, and Only guess keys. what? Those are running out too. Yeah, yeah, keys so, are fine. Yeah, that's true. So unless uh, Torn Banner would like to generate keys and just hand them out like tech tags, no, nope, already happen. asked. Ah, so they are not even going to do that, even though they're no. not going to make money. I, that, they didn't even respond to me. They've, been, they've responded for before for even like larger demands. And when I asked for keys, I'm like, come on, you guys got to have like a vault somewhere. <laughs> even not, even we'll like, we'll buy them too. But we just want to have like an assured way to guarantee that we can continue to play the game. If we were able to, I guess, kickstart a community around it. We were like, even if we could buy them from you, like, at least it would be better than buying from, from G2A, surely. They, they, they didn't say no, they just didn't respond. And 
email, personal DM, nothing. So I actually hosted all of my servers out of my house. I at one point had five servers running. Oh wow! Um, and one of the big reasons I took it, I have fucking bulletproof networks. Absolutely fucking bulletproof. Uh, I route my traffic through my work. It's great. But uh, players attempted to DDoS me. I, I, I that was it for me. That, at that point, that um, Mordeha just came out. And I was I was fucking done. I was I was not happy with the way the developers were, were acting. I wasn't happy with the fact that someone fucking tried to DOS me. Like what like like why would you do that? It's so pointless. These guys are some of the most passionate fans of a game I've met so far. Definitely the most enthusiastic fans for a game that was abandoned by its developers, disliked by its target audience, and on top of that, a game that is very hard to get played. Which made me question how it must have been like to see the game shut down. Like, oh my god, dude. Imagine your parents get murdered. Like, imagine you literally just like are at your parents' house and then like some guy walks in the door and just shoots both of them in the skull and and then brutalizes their body. And then, yeah, it just felt like that. There was, the way they handled shutting this game down was really abrupt and kind of brutal. I was actually in talks with the server uh, development team at the time to get more uh, central servers online because there was a lot of east and west coast servers mm -hmm. but everyone played on central because there wasn't enough of a player base to populate those so everyone had to like agree okay we'll all play around 60 milliseconds lag uh, and play to central servers um, and in the middle of those conversations he didn't know that they were shutting down the servers or anything like that it was just done we were talking about it gdpr happened and they were like dang we can use this as a great excuse to shut down the servers and they gave us i think till sometime in july as a heads up and we were just there's nothing we could do about it and that's when i reached out to see if i could buy the rights to the game and they didn't they just didn't want anything to do with it um the mirage leftovers was not formed until after a while um after like you know everything happened by a guy named dark dark started it all in terms of the mirage leftovers and he simply just started it by putting an advertisement out on the steam forums and also on the torn banner forums and also on other discords and then eventually those who were feeling you know sick like sick you know if they wanted mirage right especially since mordhau was not was just not the same yeah and chivalry was dead uh, they wanted that itch again. They wanted to play Mirage again, a polished, you know, experience that was like no other. And so then they found his ads and then they joined. And then eventually we grew to be a community of a few hundred. It was never too big, but it was always enough to fill the server. And then we just played like that for years to come until Chivalry 2 came out. While I was not able to experience the game at its peak, specifically when the community was lively and active, I can definitely say Mirage is a hidden gem. Its unique setting and gameplay made it a game worth coming back to even when I only had bots for company. This wasn't just a chivalry clone, an Overwatch clone, or anything along those lines. It was a game that stood on its own merits, having new ideas and offering up an engaging multiplayer experience. So I can understand why Dave and Pandora felt so strongly about the game's demise and why they made their attempts to bring it back from the grave. This is the first time I have looked at a game that not only died, but was outright killed by its creator. It is a sad fate, and also a bit disappointing, that Mirage was abandoned and not brought back to life. I would like to bring up some numbers. Chivalry 2 sold an impressive 300,000 copies in just 10 days after it released on Steam selling over 2 million copies total across all platforms. Really fucking impressive for an indie game. The fact of the matter is, Torn Banner is doing well now. The company isn't a relatively inexperienced indie studio anymore. They got over the disaster that was Mirage and were able to develop and release Chivalry 2, which is a massively successful game. So I believe the bare minimum they could do for game history preservation's sake is to release the game on Steam or elsewhere absolutely for free. They don't necessarily have to hold servers, but they could just implement what they need to implement to make the game GDPR compliant, put it out there for people to download, 
and if they really do not want to have the game on life support, they could even make the community do the rest. I am aware that releasing the game for free would have its costs, but one thing I can definitely assure, it certainly won't be competition to Chivalry 2. A release would be nice, but I am not anticipating anything. Sadly, it seems Torn Banner would like this game to stay forgotten forever, and it's possible that some of their community feel the same way. Hopefully, we can see some kind of restoration, but if not, then rest in peace, Mirage. Wait, wait, wait a second. We are not done yet. This game may be dead and most of you might not even consider purchasing a key for it and play it, but for everyone else who is interested, stick around for an exciting look into the files of this game. A dedicated server guide and an exploration of the possibilities of modding. So, say, you have the game and want to start hosting a dedicated server for yourself and your friends. Either to play by yourself with bots or against your friends one versus one. Setting up a dedicated server should be relatively easy and all you need to do is be able to read and write and to not be scared away from the Windows command terminal or PowerShell. A dedicated server guide exists on Steam, although it is incomplete and faulty. You also may see that a dedicated server download exists on Steam. This installation of the server should work, but I will show you the Steam CMD installation process instead. Using Steam CMD is advantageous, as the dedicated server can be installed on any computer, even one that does not possess a Steam installation. If you want to use the dedicated server tools that are ready to download on Steam instead, jump ahead in the video to the next chapter. Also, make sure to follow the instructions in the free PDF I have created, Mirage Arcane Warfare, the dedicated server and archival guide, in which you can also find hyperlinked downloads. Anyhow. On to the installation. Download the Steam CMD archive and extract it to a folder of your choosing. To run Steam CMD, you open the command terminal and navigate to the file location. To change hard drives, you type the assigned hard drive letter, followed by a colon, and to change directories on the hard drive, you type CD, space, and then the folder you want to navigate to. Don't forget to use backslashes for folder paths on the Windows terminal. On Linux, you may need to use forward slashes instead. It depends on the OS, just look it up. Navigate to your Steam CMD installation folder. Now, inside of the folder, you type Steam CMD to initialize the service. And to download Mirage Can Warfare's dedicated server, you can log in anonymously and thus do not need to log in using your account details. To log in, type login space anonymous. Now, you can choose to pick an install directory by typing in force underscore install underscore dir and then the path. Or, if you are like me, you can choose to ignore the step. Then, something that the guide does not mention by the way, you type in the command to download the server. Type in plus app underscore update 369630. Now you wait for the download to complete. This can take a good while. After the download is complete, just type quit to close Steam CMD and close the command terminal. So your server is officially installed. Now, how do you use it? In order to host a dedicated server, first you have to forward your ports. Apparently you don't really have to forward any specific ports inside of a router, but I had to do it anyways. It didn't work otherwise. I forwarded my ports on UDP and TCP on a range from 27,000 to 27,015. Also, in case your dedicated server stops working out of the blue after weeks or months of use, the cause of this could be that your IP address changed over time. So a troubleshooting step you could take in case that happens would be to open the terminal and type in ipconfig and then cross-reference the IP address pictured on the router settings with the address shown inside of the terminal. If there is a mismatch, delete the port forward settings and just do the port forwarding again. It really isn't all that hard, right? Now, go to the Steam CMD install folder and navigate to Steam Apps, and then Common. In there, you can find a Latte dedicated server. That is the Mirage dedicated server. 
open the folder. Now you are confronted with a typical Unreal Engine 4 folder structure. The Engine folder is generally uninteresting for both the game files and the server files. Navigate TBL, then Binaries, Win64, and there we have it, an .exe file. If you try to open this .exe, nothing seems to happen. But if you open the Task Manager, you will see that a process named TBL is running. Don't worry, your server is not broken. It just has no GUI. So keep your task manager open and kill the process anytime you need to, to make changes to the shortcut or the server settings. So now hold Alt and drag the .exe file into the same folder or any other place you would like the shortcut to reside in and release. Now edit the launch options of the shortcut by right clicking and editing the properties. Leave the already existing text alone. Right after the quotations, you can type in your dash port and dash query port commands. The query port is especially important as it allows your server to be discovered over the internet on Steam. If you only want to host a LAN game, you can disregard the query port. Type in dash port equals 27015 or any other port number you chose to port forward before and type the same number or another of your choosing after typing dash query port equals. If your game does not show up in the server list, the port number you have chosen might be reserved by a service already or you fucked up somewhere in the port forwarding process. Again, I recommend using port 27015. The dash log command you see here should start a GUI, yet it doesn't. Disregard it. Here you can also choose to start the server on a specific map. Right after the quotation marks in the target window, you can type in the name of any map you like to start the server on. I chose TO underscore Bazaar. I will get to what certain components of map names mean later. So, now you could start your server. But if you do, you get a generic server name and a map rotation that is pre-configured in the file somewhere. Let us actually configure our server now. Navigate to Latte Dedicated Server TBL Config, and here they are configuration files. Defaultgame.ini is where the settings of a dedicated server can be configured and altered. Open it. Here you can see many interesting commands. The most interesting ones are the following. Under Script Engine Game Mode, B is 10 V10 Game Mode equals false. Change the false to true and you enable your server to support 10 versus 10 matches. True and false are boolean values, with false or zero meaning off, and true or one meaning on. If you ever have trouble understanding boolean logic, picture a light switch. It can only have two states, an on or off state. Boolean logic. Under script TBL TBL game mode, you can find a laundry list of settings which are all adjustable like time settings with values representing minutes or seconds, more self-explanatory boolean commands, and a .maplist equals command. This command is used to load a map into the server's map rotation. Keep in mind that the map at the top is going to be the first map the server loads, and maps are changed in a descending order. You can also place a map name inside of a shortcut command to initialize the server starting on a specific map with a map rotation descending from that point on. Under this category, you can also change your server's name. Use any name you like. It does not hurt to get creative. If the server is online and you want to signal a specific mode of play to the players, it helps to describe the game mode too. Speaking of game modes, TO stands for Team Objective, AR for Arena, PS is a Payload Game Mode, CP stands for Capture Points, TDM is Team Deathmatch, and CTF is Capture the Flag. Here are all available maps. Also, make sure to check that the command BUSEMAPLIST is set to true. Class Limits commands are used to set how many players can fill a specific class in the game. If you want to get a competitive 6 vs 6 match going, it could be quite interesting to set the class limits to 1, so each player plays a different class, making a competitive team objective match a little more exciting. You could also disable the class by typing in 0. The class limit is set to minus 1 by default. 
If you want to remove the class limit, reset the value to minus one. The next command, which is vital for your server, is bconfigbotassistedServer. Set this one to true to enable bots. Bots work well enough to have some basic fun in the game, although they are quite limited. In some maps their navigation also is completely busted. The following maps listed here have bots working properly. Definitely give the other maps a look though. The level designers of Mirage Arcane Warfare did a fantastic job on this game. Next we go to the script TBL backend services section. In here you can input Steam account IDs of yourself and your friends to set yourself as admins or moderators of a server. You can find your Steam app ID on this website. This will enable you to use a multitude of commands in-game to control the server a bit without needing to leave the game, and you can even explore files and features Torn Banner probably did not intend you to use. More on that in a later chapter. This was pretty much it for the server settings. Explore the config on your own too. Maybe you can find more interesting settings. Also, check the dedicated server guide on Steam. It shows many more interesting settings, and even though that guide is incomplete, it is worth checking out for admin commands and other more advanced features too. Like the ability to modify aspects of characters through data table overrides. Those tables can be found in Latte Dedicated Server TBL Content Data Table Overrides. Finally, a glimmer of hope to the people who may run a cracked copy of this game. In the INI file, defaultengine.ini, under the category Online Subsystem Steam, you can disable Valve Anti-Cheat and maybe even disable a connection to Steam altogether. Worth a try. But look out, your server may not appear on the Internet tab and you would need to connect to the server through a console command. Now, after you have made your modifications to the server, you can finally hop in game and play. And depending on if you set your query port, you will be able to view your server on the Internet tab. Well done, you successfully are hosting a server. Naturally, this server only stays online as long as your computer is on and the dedicated server is running. Make sure to double check the task manager to see if a process named TBL is running. Now, let's have more fun. Did you know that you can access features and maps using Mirage Arcane Warfare's in-game console? Yes, this game actually has a console, but to access it and get all the cool commands, we need to check out the game's configuration files first. Go to your game installation folder and navigate to TBL config. Here you can see various configuration files, similar to the files found in the dedicated server directories. In this directory, open the default game.ini and scroll down to the script TBL backend services section. Add your Steam account ID in the admin line. Now you have access to all the console commands outside of the server. The only thing left to do is to assign the console key. In the same config folder, open defaultinput.ini and search the file by pressing Ctrl F and find console key. Replace none with whatever key you like. I use whatever one is that is situated above the tabulator. Save the settings and exit. Now you have the ability to mess around with files and search up a multitude of common Unreal Engine 4 console commands. Then you can explore the interesting world of Mirage prototype maps, never meant to be seen by the player's eyes. We also have a great utility tool at our fingertips, which would be demo recording. A demo is essentially a gameplay recording which can be viewed and manipulated. This is not a normal video recording, it rather records a game session in full 3D the only thing you need to do is type demo rec demo name to commence a recording, demo stop to stop the recording, and later on demo play demo name, yeah you have to remember the name, to play back the recording. Playing back a demo will boot you out of an in-progress game mind you. This function sadly is a bit broken. Demos like to bug out and not function all that well and starting a demo recording can also cause the game to glitch out a bit. Don't let this deter you from experimenting though. Now we delve into an even deeper rabbit hole. With Mirage being an abandonware multiplayer only title, we can consider ourselves lucky that the game even has dedicated server support and bot support, 
and that the servers even show up on the browser at all. But what the game has in player-hosted servers, it lacks in accessible cosmetic items and mod support. Earlier iterations of the Unreal Engine are widely known to be moddable, yet cumbersome, with some games even being able to be modded by using transplanted UDKs from completely different games. For Unreal Engine 4, the situation looks a bit more dire. Games do not tend to come packaged with editors anymore, and that also is the case for Mirage. But what that game does come packaged with is a U-Project file, a lot of encrypted U-Asset files which contain the game's assets, and a bunch of files that possess file extensions you may never have seen before. What I could make out in the files of the game is that Mirage Arcane Warfare uses Unreal Engine 4.11, good information to have for Unreal game modding. Based on that information, I downloaded Unreal Engine 4.11, a very old version of the engine, which also uses an older version of Visual Studio, which was the engine's compiler back then. Getting a file with the correct Visual Studio version was an arduous experience, but once I got Unreal and the compiler installed, I was good to go. Or so I thought. Upon trying to open the uProject file in Unreal, it became clear very fast that you cannot just open any game's project files. You would need to rebuild the game from source in order to do so. Rebuilding from source means that we need the uncooked files inside of a source folder in order to gain access to the project. But sadly, we do not have those uncooked files. And yeah, in case you were wondering, cooked and uncooked are real terms used to describe files. Uncooked files, like raw and unprocessed ingredients for a dish, are used to construct the game. When the game is finished, all the files are cooked, meaning that they get processed and repackaged, ready to be put on Steam. Some programs specialize in exporting files from asset libraries, like the program UModel, or Unreal Model Viewer, which can extract assets out of UDK files from the Unreal Engine 3 and lay all its contents bare. But for Unreal Engine 4, the software only exports certain files inside of the U asset collections. Speaking of software, various solutions exist to get some modding going. A very recent release is an Unreal Engine 4 dumper by Guided Hacking, which seems to be easy enough to use. Then we have the aforementioned U model, which is a must have for anything Unreal Engine. And then we also have the Unreal Mod Unlocker by Illusory Software, which injects itself into a game's executable and makes it able to load assets into the game files. And those tools are not just good for Mirage, they're good for any Unreal game. Replacing things like textures would certainly be possible in this game, but what is a bit more interesting for a multiplayer experience is the possibility to add more maps and maybe to write a server emulator for the item servers to unlock all items found inside of the game. A big mystery is if maps can get automatically downloaded by the client connecting to the host, and if Mirage would recognize and run custom maps in the first place. Anyhow, after my first Unreal Engine 4 experiment blundered, I found something interesting. Unreal Engine 4 modding always is rather cumbersome, needing custom engine branches and a lot of setup. But for Unreal Tournament 4, you could just download the Unreal Tournament Editor, a very special branch of Unreal Engine 4.15, which can allow a modder to create maps and assets with cooked files. The plan for this experiment looked like this. Download the UT editor, go into the engine files, copy the TBL folder from Mirage into the engine folder, and rename it and the uProject file to Unreal Tournament, and then see what happens. After a few missing DLL errors, and an offer to rebuild the project from source, I blundered again. Yeah, I came close, but no, this is not gonna work, unless an ex-developer would like to hand us the DLLs or source files. I also tried putting all the files of the game inside of the Unreal Tournament root folder. That also didn't work. So, yeah, it was worth a try. Well, what is there to do? Reverse engineering central server structures to unlock cosmetic items for everyone and figuring out a good way to make the game available to everyone would be significant goals. And you know, since you can actually look at the source code of the Unreal Engine, you could also modify the Unreal Engine to be able to modify cooked files and the like, but that 
might take a very long while to actually get going. Thankfully, cracking the game using the Goldberg emulator does work. The only mystery at hand being if it even is possible to connect to an online game over a non-Steam copy. I don't see any reason why a LAN game shouldn't work, but in order to make the game playable for all, we need to think about cracking and running the game outside of Steam. Well, maybe the NSA could help. This is an open source software named Ghidra, and I wasn't joking. This program was developed by the NSA using American taxpayer money. Thank you Americans! After locating the Mirage EXE in the binaries folder, we load the EXE into Ghidra, or into this software called IDA Pro, and we wait for hours on end to let it analyze the executable. In IDA Pro, PDB files can be loaded when prompted during the process or after the initial analysis is complete. Do this. Torn Banner shipped multiple PDB files with the game. After hours of waiting, we have this, a list of functions, assembly code and interpreted C++ pseudocode. This is as close to the source code as we can get. You can browse the functions, click on them and then examine the machine code and pseudocode. The application of the software would be to either fully reverse engineer the game for years on end or to look at certain components of the code in order to deduce how some systems may work inside of it. If we can figure out what components of the code make up the functions used to phone home to the central servers, we could make educated guesses and build a central server of our own which could replace the one torn banner shut down years past. Here are some of my findings. When searching for game results, we can find functions which may be related to the end of round level up screen. In the pseudocode, we can also see Google protobuf, mentioned repeatedly. Protocol buffers by Google are language and platform neutral and are used in order to structure data. You apparently define how the data ought to be arranged and protocol buffers generate special source code that enables you to read and write structured data. Well, that is a good hint, they clearly used it. Then searching for item, you can also browse through functions which control loadouts and customization slots, and U inventory tables seems to handle the different unlockables. Functions including the keyword player may include further clues regarding player stats and customization options. Also, while we are at it, let us highlight U experience level functions, which seem to handle the player level ups. Really, just search up any keyword that might be interesting to look up, especially things that seem to be more specific in regards to Unreal Engine games. Good luck, in case you want to try and revive this game. It might need both game devs and system admins to actually make it happen. Or, you know, Torn Banner could implement a fucking EULA into their game, host a server, and make the game free to play and be done with it, saving us a bunch of work. They could also put in big bold fucking letters, this game is not supported anymore, so download if you want to have fun. They don't even need to support it, just host the server, put a fucking EULA in, and that's it. Just push it out. Anyways, maybe reverse engineering using the code and the many tools presented before could lead to a revival project for Mirage Arcane Warfare, which of course may only happen if enough skilled people are really interested in this game. I specialize in making videos. I may dabble with code and modding from time to time, but most of my energy is spent aggregating and presenting information. I am interested in Mirage, and I still want to see it blossom. But the way Torn Banner killed this game makes things hard for us. Maybe a different legal person other than Torn Banner could pick up the flag, or in this case, Jin, where it has been left collecting dust. I want to point something out. The trademark for Mirage Arcane Warfare has been terminated or is expired. As long as a new game does not violate Torn Banner's copyright by using their code or assets, a wholly different studio could develop a spiritual successor of their own. It's a nice thought. But I am not getting my hopes up. You should not either. Thank you for watching.